Hi, Keisha here of New World Tarot, and thank you for joining me today for a review and a reading. And today I'm doing one of my new favorite decks that I have recently acquired. And this is the Alchemical Tarot by Robert M. Place. And Robert M. Place is an amazing gift to tarot. He is an incredible historian who has just an incredible depth of knowledge as far as the history of the tarot and cartomancy in general. And this deck he's created, and he is both creator and the illustrator for this deck. And it is just an absolute gorgeous, magical, historical thing of beauty <laughs> to really work work with and I really really enjoy it um, so firstly I must mention um, this deck actually comes with no guidebook uh, which uh, that comes with it so when you in other words when you purchase the deck itself you are just going to get the deck and he actually has a very short digital little white book that is sold not sold, but actually that you can actually access on his website. So you can literally, you know, put it on, put his website on your phone, bookmark it, and that will, will serve as your little white book. Um, super brief, but when you do purchase it, this you're going to get, just going to get this little carton box. And this is the fourth edition of this awesome deck. So there are three um, editions that preceded this one. So this is the latest, the one that's, if you purchase the deck, new uh this is what you will you will get all right and first of all so let's start with the book so though he has no guidebook per se this book is actually sold separately through his site and this is called the tarot magic alchemy hermeticism and neoplatonism okay and a subtitle here it reads with a guide to the waitsmith tarot the alchemical tarot which is what we'll be reviewing today and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. So the Alchemical Tarot and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery are two tarot decks that he has made. Um, and this, as you can tell, this book is quite beefy. <laughs> quite the book. And it serves as, as basically uh, an, an entire history of basically what it says. It's all about magic, the occult, cardamancy, and how all these things connect the entire history of cardamancy that he has unraveled and in addition to that so it's part history book and then also part guide book that you can actually use and I highly recommend if you're going to get this deck actually to get this book as well like I bought them directly from his website both these together and it came super fast through priority mail and I was surprised actually like a couple days later I had it on my bookshelf but um, this book is pretty amazing. And I'm just, I know you probably can't read the table of contents, but I'm just going to super read them very quickly. Um, we have Introduction. Uh, chapter 1 is In the Beginning. Egyptian Magic and Religion. The Birthplace of Astrology. The Philosophy of Magic. The Hellenistic Synthesis. The Middle Ages. Alchemy. Archetypal Numbers. The Early Tarot. The Occult Tarot. Interpreting the Allegory, The History of Cardamancy, Meaning in the Minor Suits, The Cards of the Opus, which is the Major Arcana chapter, guidebook, really, and The Fourfold World, which is the Minor Arcana chapter, and Divination and Beyond, which he basically talks about some spreads, talks about his use of the cards, gives his tips on reading, on studying, etc. And then we have, of course, Appendixes. Uh, glossary of alchemical symbols, which is really, really interesting. And he also talks, has a little um, blurb on the Lenormand as well. So this book is really beefy. It is full of all sorts of information, of pictures. And so if we, for example, you know, go to our section so the cards of the opus is where we're going to start the guidebook section of these cards and it's really really interesting because he actually let's see if i can find for example so here we have 
a, ch a chapter on, so this is a hierophant. And for all the pictures, you can actually see the first one he begins with the Visconti Sforza deck here, which is, of course, an old uh, Italian deck. And then he moves on to the, the Rider Waite Smith here. The bottom left-hand corner is going to be the picture for the alchemical tarot, which is what we're doing today. And then over here, he has the tarot of the sevenfold mystery, which is his other deck. And he kind of just goes, talks about the history of the card. And he also discusses previous, how, um, basically inspiration for where the early decks got their imagery for the cards and also where he got his imagery as well. So it's actually really, really, really fascinating. And he continues this for all of them. And I def definitely really, really, really highly recommend this book. It is very fascinating. It's obviously a work of love by uh, Robert M. Place. He was a fascinating individual. And I think he has a little bit on himself about how he came to kind of use, come up with this whole thing where he's using the pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone as an allegory for the journey of the, the fool's journey in the tarot, which is really, really, really interesting. Okay, so highly recommend that. Good book. All right, so this is our deck here, and this is the box that it comes in, and this is indicative of the card backs that we'll see. And so first of all, I have to tell you, when you get your deck, it is going to be white. <laughs> the white edg edging, I should say. So you'll have just plain white um, all around the sides here. Mine are tinted a little bit slightly gold because this actually is a failed edging attempt. I actually went, tried to edge my deck in antique gold and the, I think it was, the, I think it's Sacred Seed, I think, who did a really good, um, YouTube tutorial on how to edge your deck and she recommended Sharpie I believe and I didn't I went to the store I didn't couldn't find Sharpie but they did have Bic <laughs> so I used the Bic one and it kind of was a fail it's kind of still there but kind of even though I let it dry overnight it kind of as soon as I started shuffling the cards it kind of came off so listen to her and use Sharpie and not Bic to edge your cards <laughs> so I actually have to do it again but that's why mine are gold and but yours will be white uh, when you get this deck all right, so I'm just going to go through this beautiful deck. And here we have our backs as well. And he has a, hi a history, you know, basically describing how he came up with these. And yes, he illustrated all of these. All right, and I absolutely love this deck. So let's go through it. All right, so... First thing we have, so let me get this out the way. All right, so we have I might, the full. Let's see if I can find my ideal lighting here. No. All right, and these cards are really, really glossy. So excuse me while I find a good area. Excellent. Make sure it's nice. Beautiful. Okay, and we have the magician. So one thing you'll notice too is that these cards have a lot of symbol symbols on them. And I'm gonna try to do my best to try to explain some of these symbols as we go along. But of course, we have the magician here, and the magician represents um I get prima materia, and which is basically the, the mankind has everything already that's needed for the Philosopher's Stone. And we see here all the astrological symbols. We have planetary symbols. We have element symbols all here together. All right. So he has, you know, dominion over all of these, everything that's needed to reach enlightenment represented in this car. And I really, really love the alchemical. I think it's very different, very unique, and adds another, a, a deeper layer to the cards here. So we have the high priestess, and 
we had a couple symbols here and the top symbol in upper right hand corner is this is actually not Aquarius what this represents is the first dissolution so basically what he's saying is spirit um, will has dissolved itself into four elements four primal elements that will be found throughout the world throughout tarot and uh, this represents first dissolution of water which is here so this she's the high priestess is first water and we have the empress which is first dissolution of earth in the corner it's a symbol the emperor now and there are some differences here that um, mr. place has has chosen to make he, where he differs from the Rider white he actually this deck obviously is based on older decks that predated the Rider white so a lot of the what we consider the you know classic um, elemental symbols the writer the Golden Dawn made those made changes to the deck in in their version of the deck so here this is one of them the Emperor I know is often associated with fire uh, if you're reading by the Rider weight system but this actually is first dissolution of air and here the Emperor is associated with this the element of air here all right and it kind of in a way makes sense because even in the Rider weight the kind of sort of elemental thing water and fire are opposites and air and earth are are opposites so here we have air air and earth being opposites and then we would have fire and water being opposites okay so in here this deck, the Hierophant, is associated with fire. So we have the symbol here, first dissolution of fire. And so he represents the masculine and a uh, very regimented, you know, controlled approach to spirituality to counter the feminine approach to spirituality. Okay. All right, and in... A tarot tradition we actually have two lovers cards okay and they're quite different so um, this one and when I pull this out uh, to read with other people this is the most popular one that people tend to like and this is lovers card number one and the symbol here is conjunction all right we have a union of Sun and Moon, Masculine and Feminine. And the alternate card to that is the Lovers, another Lovers. And this one obviously is much more intense. So they are actually in the act of consummation here. Which I find very, so, and there, yes, you can tell there's, there's going to be a little bit of a, some nudity and whatnot in these cards. And, but it's tastefully done and really, really beautifully done. All right, so then we have the chariot. And the alchemical symbol here is sublimation, which I believe is when um, water turns into gas as it approaches, gets hotter. And because this is representative of approaching the sun, so rising up, which, you know, the chariot energy is very much, you know, about being focused and driven and driving yourself in the right direction and moving up in the world um, as you get closer to the Sun as water gets closer to the Sun it turns into gas so this is sublimation representing the ascension up towards the Sun of water turning into gas and the symbols here I believe are for salt uh, mercury down here salt and sulfur I believe 
And these are, to, to, are representative of the alchemical trio that is needed to achieve the philosopher's stone. And how I like to visualize this is, of course, Mercury being representative of the magician. You know, mankind driving two opposing elements, but using them to drive himself forward and upward into the sun. And we have justice. So uh, Mr. Place has chosen to stick with the, the traditional order of the Major Arcana, which before the Rider Waite came along, justice was number eight. And Rider Waite switched it out to number 11. But now he's chosen to keep the original order. So justice is number eight. And this is a absolutely gorgeous depiction of justice that I absolutely freaking love. Justice is not usually a warm and fuzzy card by any means that I like. <laughs> it tends to kind of, uh, you know, like it's kind of like a cop when a cop shows up and I'm like, oh God, what did I do now? You know, I kind of like, yikes. But this justice card is beautiful and it, you can kind of, it almost has like a high priestess feel to it. This alchemical symbol here, I believe is disposition which is the weighing of things against each other to find the truth. And the fire in her crown, you can see an, it's kind of hard to see in my camera, but you can see an eyeball kind of in the middle of there. And that is representative of the anima mundi, which is the soul of the world. So basically spirit, God, um, weighing things. So you can see, it looks like she has in the scale either water or air on one side and fire on the other, but they are perfectly balanced. And she has made the distinction, the determination that they are very different, but equal. So this is a beautiful card. And then we have the hermit. And this is also an awesome and beautiful hermit card as well. And the symbol here is exhalation, I believe is the, the symbol inside of here. And it is about the, uh, basically the, the improving, I believe, or the rising of quality of something. And the black crow that's on his shoulder is representative of the Negredo, which is the uh, one of the first steps in forming the Philosopher's Stone proper. And he's following footsteps because he's actually following the footsteps of the Anima Mundi or following the footsteps of the soul and of spirit moving in the world. And he's, he's left the town behind. You can see a little town. And he so he's isolating himself in order to find the truth of spirit in the world. And we have the Wheel of Fortune. And I love this rendition of this card. Uh, the Wheel of Fortune is, the, basically the name of this card is the, the Fixed and the Volatile. And the symbol in the corner here is circulation, which basically means that in order for us to achieve enlightenment, for us to get to the level of the Philosopher's Stone, we have to experience cycles and we have to experience cycles of movement, stagnation, movement, stagnation over and over again. That is just the way of the world and it is natural and necessary for your, your advancement. And we have one of my favorite strength cards of all time. And I absolutely love this rendition. And we have here strength riding the green lion. And I believe this symbol down here is a symbol for the green lion. And this is a symbol for fermentation. So the green lion is, I think, another sort of a allegory or a metaphor for toxic mercury, basically mercury poisoning. And 
that's brilliant because Mercury is associated with the magician, associated with mankind. So basically what we, we have here in this picture is her writing and subduing the toxicity in mankind. So she, with kindness, is basically overtaking all that is evil and vile in mankind. And the fermentation symbol, I believe, is basically um, strength is spirit fermented in challenge. And that's how you get strength. And strength is all about love, too, which is why we have this little, this heart here. We have the hanged man. Which is, oh, I'm really doing my best with this. I don't know why I can't figure this out. Okay. All right, we have the hanged man here. And the symbol, alchemical symbol here is calcin calcination which is tur the turning of ash. So he's taking something and burning it and turning it into ash. And this really, um, for Mr. Place, is about the kind of the suffering, basically. The suffering that we go through and how it actually, you know, helps us to be strengthened. You know, it's about finding comfort and the wisdom and the beauty in suffering. And we have death. Yeah. Okay. And we got a skeleton here. And he, this is still in the phase of the Philosopher's Stone known as the Negredo. This apparently what he's standing on is the Negredo. The crow on his shoulder symbolizes the Negredo. And the alchemical symbol here is putrefaction, which is, again, the falling away of the flesh, the falling away of the ego, the falling away of things that no longer serve you. And the arrow that he's holding is actually symbolic of love in many ways, can be a type of death. It doesn't always feel, you know, it doesn't, it's not always frightening and, you know, painful. It can actually be explosive and wonderful and orgasmic as well. And we have temperance. All right. And the symbol here is distillation, which is all about distilling things to their core elements and mixing and blending. And we have the devil. All right. And what a hellish image that is. <laughs> so we got, I think the Negredo is still down here. We got the dragon here and we have a hermaphrodite that are stuck together. And the alchemical symbol here is a coagulation, which is basically the solidifying of two of two or more things together. It is kind of a hellish process where you kind of feel like you're stuck. You're stuck in place. You're stuck to everything that's around you, just kind of melds together. It just makes a, a hellish mess. So we all know that the devil is all about um, feeling, feeling that you're stuck, that you're chained to something. But there always is a way out. We just have to be brave enough and really want to free ourselves. It's possible. And we have the tower. And the, sim the alchemical symbol in this corner is not cancer. So that, you know, astrologically that would be cancer, but this actually means the greater distillation, I believe. And this scene here is a, a greater dissolution, sorry, the greater dissolution. And this 
seen here is actually a man and a woman at what's called an athenor, which is a stove that's used in alchemy. And of course it is being struck by God and broken. And on what, out of one spout, we have blood out of the other spout, you have milk. So blood to the man, milk to the woman and blood represents fears and milk represents hope. And you know, whenever we do get a tower moment, there is a lot of fear that could be, you know, suffering of the ego that comes with it. But being that it is an act of God creating this, we have to also concentrate on the hopes and the blessings that this clearing brings us. And we have the star. And this is one of my favorite star cards of all time. I've always loved the, um, the Starbucks symbol that has the, the two fish, the two tailed mermaid as well. And this is one of the images that made me want to get this deck. Like I've always, I just, I don't know what it is about this image that I've all, I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. But we have, um, once again, we have, the uh, two, she's having two jets coming out of her breast. One is blood, the other is milk. Blood again representing our fears. So reminiscence of the tower before it, fear and suffering. And out of the other is milk and blessing and, and hope. And I believe the alchemical symbol is baptism. That is in the corner. All right, and we have the moon here and beautiful moon. And we have our two dogs and we do have the, this time, this does mean cancer. All right, the moon being the ruling planet of cancer. We have a little cancer crab up in the corner. And this symbol, I believe, means the white stone. And the white stone is the mother stone of the philosopher's stone. So this is the uh, feminine, the divine feminine stone that is responsible for uh, the creation of the, the philosopher's stone, which again represents um, enlightenment. And then we have the sun. And so this is... We see here the, the um, I believe he said it's the emperor and the empress coming together. And the symbol that's in the corner is greater conjunction. And we have judgment. And the symbol down here is resurrection. And finally, we have the world. And beautiful card here. And the symbol here up here is the philosopher's stone. All right, so that's the majors. So let's quickly go through the minors. So in uh, this deck, we have staffs, vessels, swords, and coins. So we have the, uh, the ace of staffs. The two of staffs. Three of staffs, the 
four of staffs. And he really, really brought out the, um, the balance aspect of the four, the four of staffs here. Oops. <laughs> and the five of staffs. And some of these cards do have a different meaning from what uh, you might be used to in uh, the Rider weight. Like this is actually one of them. The five of staffs we are usually so often associate with, um, you know, the Hermet title, the Lord of Strife. We have these five uh, individuals kind of fighting each other. And but this one is actually about spirit moving through your projects, moving through your art and potentially um, burnout as well in your art projects, in your career, that sort of a thing. And we have the six of staffs. And the seven. All right, and this meaning is a little bit different too. We have the two dogs fighting. And this is more about severe competition and warring and fighting and violence. We have the eight of staffs, and this also is different than a, the usual eight of wands. And this one is more about cutting back our projects to prevent overwhelm. Cutting out what's no longer needed. Got the guy with the ax. And this is the nine of staffs, beautiful card. And this also is a little bit different than a typical nine of wands. This one is about sacrifice. This is called the sacrifice of the gray wolf. And it is about asking you what you need to sacrifice in order to achieve your goals and your ambitions. And we have the 10 of staffs or Phoenix. All right, and we have the court cards and he's taking a different flavor with the court cards as well. Instead of pages, we have ladies and the lady cards are the earth. Like if you think of how each court card is an element, so you kind of have an element in an element. Like for example, pages would be a page of, you know, the page of wands would be earth of fire. He's done the same thing here, I believe. He has kind of embraced the beauty of the earth suit in all of these court cards. So the ladies are all about finding the beauty and the grace in the element. So lady of staffs is this beauty and grace in the element of fire. And we have the knight. And the queen, now the, these queens actually are interesting. They are, they remind me more so of, uh, especially the two masculine queens, remind me of, they almost have a flavor of justice a little bit. And that they uh, kind of have a weighing quality to them and a quality of choice. Like for example, this, the queen of staffs ask, which is, you know, which is better, the, the highly refined and sophisticated, which represents the brass torch and the electric torch or gas torch or whatever, or the crude and natural, which represents the, uh, which is represented by the wood torch. And obviously in different cases in life, one will be better, but another case, another will be better. So it's an interesting use of the queens that are a little bit different. And then we have the king of staffs. And in his decks, all of the kings are represented by animals and beast. Because the mastery of an element is something that, the perfect mastery is something that most humans can never really t entirely grasp. I think that's kind of what he's saying by making that choice. And then we have the ace of vessels, which is, this is a beautiful ace. This is one of my favorite aces of all time. This also is another card that made me want to get this. I actually printed, before I got this deck, I actually printed this out and used it as a bookmark from the, from Google, because I just thought it was so beautiful. 
And we have the two of vessels. We have the couple here. Three of vessels. All right, and these symbols, we have the elements here. So we have uh, fire, water, and air. So these are actually the, the uh, uh, I mean, or rather fire, no, fire, earth, and air, I apologize. And these are the backups to the Lady of Vessels, which, so this basically means a support group, friends, um, social support. And uh, yeah, so Vessels is his cup. So these are, I think I said that already. And then we have the four of Vessels, and this is such an interesting picture. So this is all about our just getting kind of lazy and blase in our comfort zone. This elephant has crawled out on these vessels and then just kind of got stuck there just because he just isn't willing to expand himself and explore any further. So it's kind of an interesting depiction to depict four of cups energy, which is, this is vessels, four vessels. And then we have five of vessels, and this is also a very good depiction as well of how when things break, all sorts of things release. It releases all sorts of stuff, some good, some bad. All right, we got the six of vessels. The seven of vessels. The eight of vessels and his uh, this is another card his eight he says he associates with labor and work and so his eights have a different meaning than the traditional rider weight version this symbol is uh, symbolic of the anima anima mundi which again is a soul of the world which, which is basically spirit source and this actually represents Spirit moving through your your work. So this is work that is inspired by God as opposed to very mundane work. And we have the nine of vessels, and this also is a different meaning than particular than the usual, you know, Lord of Material happiness that we have with the nine of cups. Usually this is the uh, this nine of vessels is really about um, emotional experience shaping your perspective, which I thought was interesting way to see that and then we have the ten of vessels which is all about in this deck all about connection networks family friend social groups relationships and how they affect you all right so here we have our lady of vessels so it's all about grace and you know grace and intuition emotional grace, emotional beauty, knight of vessels. It's actually kind of a comical image. <laughs> this guy in his uh, armor with this little fish down here in the corner. And queen of vessels. And this is just a very, very beautiful image in a it's all about mystery, apparently. The mystery of the subconscious. And king of vessels, we have our whale. All right, and then we have our ace of swords. And the two of swords the three of swords which wow this is an absolutely one of my favorite three of swords cards 
It's so visceral and beautiful. And how I love how the tears are watering the rose. So even in sadness and grief, there's there's growth. And the four of swords, I love this one too. It's representing the groundedness of that energy. Grounding your thoughts and your conflict. Five of swords. So this is a, also another one where the, uh, his meaning is a little bit different than a classical uh, Rider Waite Smith. So here we have a blacksmith who actually is fixing destroyed swords. And this is indicative of taking negative thoughts and turning them positive. So we have the broken negative thoughts here and he's fixing them and turning them upright. So taking the negativity and turning it in, into power. And we have the six of swords, which is one of my favorite six of swords. The six of swords is typically a card that I'm like, I never really typically connected with, but this one is beautiful. And his meaning here is all about, it, it, it's, it's similar to the regular six of swords. You have this transition, the state of moving to a better place, but what he has added is actually a note of surrender of God is actually blowing you into the right direction. So it's about surrendering to source, surrendering to spirit and trusting that he is going to put you in the right direction. Which is really beautiful, beautiful meaning and a beautiful card. And we have our sly friend here, the seven of swords. The fox. And we have our chained eight of swords, chained beast. And nine of swords. And Ten of Swords. That's a definitely a bloody mess. <laughs> it's one of the more one of the more bloody uh, Ten of Swords cards. All right, and then we have Lady of Swords. So again, we have beauty and grace in you know in learning, in communication, in poetry, in uh, you know. The written word. And we have the Knight of Swords. Really, really like that one. And again, so we have a, a Queen of Swords who's indicative of, again, justice. Looking very justice in this one. So she represents the choice between what is ripe on the red side and what is unripe on the green side. You know, and, and asking what you should, what should you do? You know, what is better? The ripe and mature or the unripe and unmature? And depending on the situation, that can change. And then we have the king of swords, who's represented by an eagle. All right, and lastly, we have the ace of pentacles and... Every single ace in this deck is so freaking gorgeous. These are, this is, I love every single one. Like often there's like, I like two aces or, or one or three at the most, but every single one is like banging to me in this deck. It's really pretty. And we have the two of coins. And this is, oh, I love this meaning. So here we have, the fixed swallowing the volatile and the two of queens here is it's similar to um, having a balance and a flow but here it's more about it's more about stagnation and it's kind of like an interrupted uh, when we saw in the wheel of fortune card earlier when we had the fixed and the stag the fixed and the volatile in balance here it's gotten out of balance. This is kind of like a block. 
and it looks like the, the cure for it is more movement. And we have the three of coins here. And we have, again, the alchemical trio of salt, sulfur, mercury. And when I look at this and I see the water in the background and the land and he's drawing, I, and I believe he's actually drawing spirit. He's at, what he's drawing is a picture of source, the anima mundi. And this card is a, to me is about the alignment of intuition and work and skill and willpower and work to produce work result and we have the four of coins we have our little miserly guy bearing his coins here and we have the five of coins and I love this depiction because um, Mr. Place has chosen to maim his left leg. His left leg in particular, the left side is indicative of your intuitive side, your feminine side. And it is, he has coins all over the ground here and it's basically saying that because he is out of touch with intuition, out of touch with source, he's surrounded by, by wealth and he's surrounded by um, means to, you know, get his needs met but because he's cut off from source and he's not paying attention to that, he can't see it. So he stays in, in poverty. And we have our six of coins here. All right. Giving and receiving. And the, he, he likes, he points it out in his book. The top coin here is actually has an owl on it to represent the wisdom of giving to receive and we have the seven of coins and this is an obelisk and it's very similar to the seven of, of coins in the, in the um the rider weight and that there's always a process from lead to gold which is alchemy and it feels like oftentimes you know we're not there yet we're somewhere you know we're waiting we're waiting for this or to reach our goal, but we're, we're somewhere along the process. We're not quite there yet. All right. And we have our planets. The planets are along the side. And we have the eight of coins. And this meaning is a little bit different, even though it, it certainly can be read in the same way. He mentions it's more about, it's more about mundane and repetitive work, work that's not so much spiritually fulfilling like it was in the eight of vessels but it's more work that is going to just put money in your pocket so you're not really emotionally invested but you know it's it's the day job or it's this just what you do to put food on the table or make money and then we have the nine of coins and this is the you know all about you know our natural wealth it's the natural process of of growing well organically and we have the ten of coins which takes on more of a um, more of a negative vibe or more of a shadow vibe I should say compared to the Rider Waite Smith where we have you know it's kind of like too much being clouded by obsession with money all right and then we have the lady of coins so she is all about um, beauty, you know, aesthetic and material beauty. And we have the Knight of Coins. It's all about guarding and protecting what you have. And we have the Queen of Coins, which is, oh, I love this one of my favorite cards too. Just a beautiful depiction of bounty and good fortune. Reminds me of the goddess Fortuna. And the king of coins, represented by the lion. All right. So we have 
there you go. So we have our deck here. And I definitely highly recommend this card. Oh, and the backs are, as I showed you, are kind of like the back of that, um, the box. And they are not reversible. Robert Plakes does not believe in, does not like to read in reversals. So his backs are not reversible. But I still read them in reverse. This deck, it's fine. Like, you know, works just fine to me. And yeah, so this is an absolute beautiful deck and I'm just going to kind of lay them out here just so you can kind of see what they kind of look like together. And yeah, they have like a similar sort of color scheme going on. So they kind of flow together, but you know, in a, in a way, but they're just really, really, really beautiful cards. And I just love the whole alchemical sort of process that kind of uh, ties us together. And I am running really low on time here. So I'm going to just do a super quick sort of review uh, reading here. So this is being the full moon in Aquarius. We can ask, you know, what can we really do to kind of just, you know, keep evolving and moving in life. And this deck is not thoroughly uh, at all sort of blended to do what I can. And beautiful. So we have three cards. So just reading this as it is, you can kind of see how they lay out. All right. So yeah. So basically what we have to always do is we have to remember, you know, first and foremost to always pursue mental mastery, to always be just. There's definitely between the King of Swords and the Queen of Swords, an absolute emphasis on right thinking, mature thinking, the Queen of Swords ask us straight away, like, what is what is the right choice and what is the immature choice? So anytime I feel like there's a social uh, question, it's a great way to decide what the right thing to do. What will advance us forward? What will grow us? And what is going to stunt us or regress us? Okay, that's a great question to ask. And Knight of Swords, once we've made that choice on what is the growth choice, We've got to just take action and fight for it and just make sure we remain moving forward there. All right. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today for this review and reading. And I hope you check out this beautiful deck. You will not be disappointed and enjoy the rest of your summer. All right. Take care.